we're going to um, now have our third hack presented by somebody that we've already heard from earlier today, Adrian Sanier. Adrian is here. He is, uh, for those of you who were, uh, saw him before, already know, he's the chief academic tech officer at ASU, uh, one of the three partners putting on Future Tense. So Adrian, and the hack is, it's too late for me though, I wish, I wish uh, somebody had done this before, how to radically improve math preparedness for college. Well, thanks very much. So, uh, so I'm taking this hack thing really seriously you now because I'm a former coder and like we mean hack as a thing. Like it's a thing you do and it's supposed to make something different when you're done. And so I know some of you are already at work trying to make sure that the government stops funding education because uh, that's, you know, that's the way this works. And so, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to get a chance to sort of pitch an idea to a set of people and see can you win somebody over. So, so um, I, there's a detailed description of this hack at my website. It's www.sanier.net. That's my last name. The test of whether my hack like inspires anybody in this room is whether that gets read, whether that gets tweeted. So we're going to find out for sure just how flat this pitch falls. Now, a colleague of mine, uh, Johnny McCoy, he says it pretty well when he says that in many ways it's easier to change the course of history than it is to change a history course. <laughs> and, and our academic institutions, I mean, like we've been talking about it all morning, right? Sometimes they, they really feel maddeningly slow to change. There's no doubt about it. And, and our schools, I think because they do so many things well, I mean, we've had to begrudgingly admit that as good as all these other models are, we're still spending our own kids to, to the colleges we went to. You know, there's a fear that we'll throw the baby out with the bathwater. But I mean, still, right? You look at all the amazing things, the ways that technology have changed everything else, and yet school seems to all of us to be a bit far behind. Now, I, I work for a very patient, very forgiving man. Those of you who know Michael Crow know that that idea that everything has to be done in micro time, that's just, well, it is true. And at last week's EdTech Summit, what he said was that the fundamental thing that's, that's keeping us from being able to advance the kinds of improvements that we expect to see, the improvements in outcome, the, the, the breaking down of credit hours, all of the various different things that we've described here, they always come down to the same thing. Can we or can we not change the culture? Can we change the hiring culture? Can we change the academic culture? Can we do it or not? And in many cases, the academic culture feels like the, the immovable rock. And so if that's the test, then that's what I want my hack to be about. I want it to be about a thing that causes the culture to change in a direction that embraces technology. Can, is there actually a hack to do that? And so the domain that I want to work in is adaptive technology. Now, a lot of you probably heard about this adaptive technology, right? It's, it's all the rage. And uh, I think there's nothing hotter, really, than, than adaptive tech. And to somehow get it across the chasm as something more than what we talk about and we invest in companies and we do a no to make it so that like when people go to school that's how they learn that's the 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 thing that that a, a, a successful hack would do in this domain now tech enthusiasts like me really expect big things out of the application of machine intelligence and big data to things like computer tutors we really think that you know, the stuff we take for granted, like, you know, you, you know how now when you go to Google, it sort of reads your mind? You know, you type in Bob Costas right before the Olympics and it goes, has pink eye, because it knows that's what you want to know, because it's mining the collective human intelligence of all the people who've been looking, right? People expect that that's going to make a big difference in math. And I could talk about like, oh, the intricacies of the algorithms and blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, it would be about getting, instead of six of 10 people to be able to master mathematics, to be able to get nine or even 10 of 10. And that is a tall order since we've been getting about the same success rates since Euclid. <laughs> so why math? Okay, so I gotta read this because you know we only have so much time, this is a hack, right? Math is an important bellwether in, in seeing whether adaptive technologies are gonna work or not. Because if they're going to live up to their promise in any way, you'll see it first in mathematics. Because math is such an important human capability. It's the gateway to true understanding of a whole host of knowledge that without understanding of mathematics, just inaccessible to you. 
science, engineering, computing, many of the things we require, mathematics is the, is the price of entry. It's the very basis of rational thinking. It's the one discipline that every people on the earth agrees to the very last letter is true. If you think two and two is something other than four, you're irrelevant to me because you'll be extinct. So math is also the language that computers speak natively. It's the most cut and dried thing on the planet. If computers are going to be able to help score us and guide us and evaluate us, mathematics is the place where it will be able to, to happen first. So if computer tutors are going to help us learn anything, we're going to see it first in math. So when's that going to happen? Right, like we've been doing this for quite a long time. When is that going to happen? And what I'm going to submit to you is it has happened. Education has had its first Napster moment. That moment where there used to be a way of doing things, and now all of a sudden, at another level of scale, there's a different way to do it. And I think the start of that was the release in August of the Khan Academy's learning dashboard. Now, many of you know the Khan Academy as the place where Salman Khan and lots of his uh, colleagues have created videos to explain the most complicated concepts in mathematics to 21 million learners. You can go to the site and these short videos explain these things that baffled you for all of your life. You know, then I strongly recommend that those, how many out there, squeeze theorem? All of you got your squeeze theorem under control? Out to the Khan Academy, bang, no time flat, you'll be up with the rest of us. So that's what the Khan Academy was. But what the Khan Academy is now is a place where there is a free, adaptive tutor provided at internet scale to every person on the planet that can get connected. And that scale changes everything. In just eight months, millions of people have been drawn to this capability. And that has strong implications, not only for how good it is now, but for how good it can become. So this tutor, what's it like? Well, it poses problem after problem to you, patiently. It'll pose problems to you till you get sick and tired. And when you come back again, it will pose them to you again. And while it does, it explores the depth of your understanding. It incrementally challenges you along a path that's specific to you. It patiently watches you do every problem. It keeps track of how many attempts you make, how many you get right, how many you get wrong, how many times you say, I don't know, this is too easy. It, it, it tracks how many minutes you spend. It tracks the periods of your inactivity. And gradually, student by student, problem by problem, day by day, the con dashboard is learning about every aspect of how people interact with mathematics. And it is building the most, it's building the largest, most detailed database of learning activity that's ever been assembled. And they've only been doing it for eight months. So what I suggest to you is that that database, properly mined, becomes a, an enormous resource for us to understand how to accelerate the teaching of mathematics. Okay, so great. Why do I think that it's on such an incredible trajectory? It's because I think that the Khan Academy is on its way to becoming one of the great internet utilities. One in a family of unbelievably valuable, yet often technically complex and seemingly massively expensive tools that are nevertheless provided to every citizen of the internet for free. Think about Wikipedia. Google search, Facebook, YouTube, all of these tools that do things that could never have been done before, done from more or less a central place for free, along a variety of different funding models. Now, the Khan Academy is based on the donation model. It's very similar to what Wikipedia is based on. And it's backed by some of the largest educational foundations in the world, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation being principal among them. The Khan Academy is uniquely positioned, I think, to provide this internet scale utility, this thing that we all agree on, all of math is well understood, the ability to continue to pose those problems and gather the behavior habits of humans and use those behavior habits to encourage personalized paths in the future. This is a unique capability that Khan can provide at this moment in time, not as, not as a future thing, not maybe we could do it right this minute, just go there now if you're bored. It's very important to understand that as an internet utility, it's not only how that thing behaves today, but the development trajectory that it can be on. Because 
It doesn't have to spend any time selling anybody. It doesn't have to spend any time lobbying anybody. It doesn't have to spend any time convincing legislators or boards. All you got to do to use the Khan Academy is decide to do it. So, what's the hack? Well, if we accept for a minute that the Khan tutor could make the kind of difference that I'm sketching out and that lots of other people believe adaptive technologies could do, What's in the way of seeing that happen right now? Like, how come everybody isn't already doing it? What will it take to move it? And this is where our President Crow is the man with the answer. It's a culture change, a fundamental shift in the way we decide to teach math. And the core of that shift is a change in approach that acknowledges that explanations of complex concepts are no longer scarce. They are plentiful. And so a math teacher's value lies much more in them being a guide through material, a person who can untangle knots, a person who can help you understand how to move forward for yourself, than it is to be a provider of explanations, a lecturer. And our experience at ASU is that changing that culture is very, very difficult. But it's a very rewarding change, and it's a change that both has room but promise for continuous improvement in a way that the Lone Eagle model never had. So if only there was some hack, some vector, some magic spell that we all could do to cause in our states, in our local areas, this new method of teaching to come about. Some way to organically spread these best practices in a kind of grassroots way, form a coalition of people who are interested and willing and able to do these things. If only there was a way to do that. You guys are in such luck. Because there is a way to do it. There's a, there is a model, and my only hack is simply to copy this model 49 more times. The model is something called the Khan Academy in Idaho. And it's an initiative that was sponsored by the J.A. and Catherine Albertson's foundation in conjunction with the Khan Academy. The hack's really simple. That's really what makes it feasible. All we have to do is replicate Khan Academy in Idaho and every other state in the Union. Khan in Connecticut, Khan in Colorado, Khan in California, Khan in other states that don't begin with K sounds, like Arizona. To combine in every state a local university that's committed to this mode of pedagogy, but has a strong method of outreach to K-12 teachers, to combine that with a sponsoring agency, a local foundation, a foundation in the state that's interested in seeing the willing, the able advance those ideas to be able to spot, excuse me, sponsor some of those initial implementations as the Khan Academy in Idaho does. That federated across the nation so that every new person that comes to that, to that decision point of trying to use the Khan Academy can find the story of someone, some team, an administrator, a technical person, a team of teachers who tackled a problem very similar to their own already and was able to achieve results using these technologies. This is the dynamic that Khan Academy in Idaho has set up and it could work in the states that you come from too. And the result would be a national guild, a national guild of educators that have learned how to effectively use the growing body of machine intelligence to help more students succeed at mathematics, a guild that would introduce a culture of personalized adaptive learning that could help it spread to the limits, not only in terms of, say, upgrades and downgrades from the first place that it comes in, but also into other subjects to the extent that those things are applicable. This idea of establishing a culture of, personal, of continuous improvement around the teaching of mathematics to go from 6 and 10 to 7 and 10 to 8 and 10, 9 and 10, to finally even the last person in the math class can get across that thing which all of us know to be very difficult. That's really what the mission of a math teacher has to be. Now we've seen this model of a public utility spreading very rapidly work in education before. When Google Apps for Education came out, in like around 2005 or 6, it was like anathema 
to use it. It was crazy talk to think that you would outsource your homegrown email system, the underpinnings of your campus's communication system, to an outside internet agency. It's now de rigueur. And that was a very short period of time to change an entire culture. And it put enormous pressure on other providers to create similar offerings to make it possible for that progress to, to, to proceed. The rate at which those tools improved once replaced was dramatic and continues to be dramatic. And so this culture change can happen. Now it's much more complicated to do it inside the classroom. And that's the reason that we've got to have some way to do it locally, state by state, in a coordinated effort that tears down the barriers between, oh, well, this is university math as though the algebra that we teach in university, particularly to our developmental math students, is in some way fundamentally different from what we would have taught you in ninth grade if we could have got hold of you then. So now's the time for the altar call, folks, right? Every pitch got its altar call. And so either this was something worth ignoring, and if it was, you should just keep ignoring it because there's plenty of things to do. But if they found this interesting in some way, I need you to go to that website, www.senior.net. And I need you to tweet that website to some people. And I need some of you to find a foundation in your state and say, hey, I heard about this idea. You should go and visit the Albertsons people because they could explain to you how we might be able to do this in our state. Because what I'm telling you is four years from now, if 27, 28, 30 states were doing this at a level that was being able to show where this was working and where it wasn't, this will become the culture of teaching math. And from it, we will learn how to teach all the other things. So uh, can we teach everybody math? Yes, we can. <laughs>
um, are people um, not only getting access to some education that they can afford, um, but are they getting access to the, uh, the right kind of education given who they are and what their particular challenges and needs are? Um, is education, is uh, information technology going to help hinder or complicate that challenge? Greg. Um, so part of our hope at the Gates Foundation is that technology will help um, and picking up on the last conversation, um, we're piloting a set of adaptive learning engines. And I think that the promise there, particularly in higher ed, is that you can reduce the size of that 200 person lecture hall to individual one to one tutoring that can accelerate both learning and knowledge acquisition, as well as provide a more equitable set of supports for low income students. You know, if you're upper or middle income, you have household wealth that can pay for private tutors. Uh, if you're lower income, you can't. And I think that this adaptive learning engine is one way that you can provide that kind of access. Uh, yes, I, um, gee, there's so much I could say. It's what a stimulating conversation it's been this morning. But let me, uh, since I'm from the Department of Education, focus on the role of public policy vis-a-vis -vis technology. And, and that is, for, and, and it's one of the reasons that I gravitated into it. You know, I spent 25 years as a technology reporter in Silicon Valley, and I saw the gap between what was and what could be and the, and, and the missing ingredient was often public policy. Let me just tell you quickly, Kevin, um, gee, it's about six, seven years ago now when I was chairman of the board of the uh, Foothill De Anza Community College District in Silicon Valley, and I was visited by a major education technology publisher. And uh, he wanted to tell me how excited they were about new developments in uh, the internet and in digitization, because it meant that for his company, uh, they would finally be able to get rid of the used textbook market and uh, every student would be required to pay full price every time. Um, and that was what got him excited. And this is a very major company. Um, and, and I don't know from a public policy standpoint that that's what many of us look at when we see what uh, technology, the opportunities that technology affords, um, that it affords the ability to create a kill switch to meter students' ability to access learning materials and to charge them for every sentence they read you know, um, we can come to a different set of opportunities by focusing on approaches epitomized by what the Khan Academy is doing. And the crucial ingredient here for how that $150 billion a year that Amy Leighton was talking about is spent is what are the public policies that we uh, implement that govern um, how we take advantage of the technology opportunity. So I guess my answer is that by itself, um, technology is just a tool, it's just a hammer. You can use a hammer to build a house, or you can use a hammer to knock a house down. And the critical thing here is uh, developing understanding and support for the appropriate public policies, which ensure that we use technology just like we used technology 100 years ago, when the technology were bricklayers and architects. The goal was to use technology to create the greatest number of uh, high quality opportunities for the greatest number of people at the lowest possible cost. So now we have a new set of, of hammers, new set of technologies, and the challenge in public policy, where the lag time has been appallingly uh, uh, long, is to um, uh, refine our public policy so that we're making the most effective use of these tools to create the, the highest quality opportunities for the greatest number of people at the lowest possible costs. So I think at, at EverFi, we look at um, this issue of inequality very seriously around the access issue and where technology has the ability to play a role. So if you think about, um, you know, our conversation today has been very much about a transfer of knowledge gain, whether it's with math or with uh, Buddhist, Buddhism through that MOOC. And we at Everfire are really focused on those non-curricular, non-academic drivers that actually you really need to be able to support students um, if we are going to actually make education attainable to them. So for example, uh, we focus with 500 colleges across the nation, about 7 million students, on the non-academic drivers that research has shown will hinder particularly first-generation students from actually getting through college. Issues like financial wellness, understanding student loans, career um, success, uh, all the way over to alcohol, substance abuse, sexual assault prevention. So all of those non-academic drivers that when you look at why students, particularly first generation students, tend not to actually, when they actually get into college, are successful there, 
is how are we actually using technology, not just to support students on the knowledge transfer, right? Did they know what a fraction was or a linear equation was going in and going out? And I think that there's some great, as we've heard today, some, some great organizations out there that are working on that. But I think that it's only half the picture of this issue around ensuring that tech can actually help on this inequality piece. And so the, if the two biggest drivers are their access to be able to get there, you know, so part of what technology is doing is taking the access to knowledge gain out. But what it has not yet done and what we are very focused on is ensuring that all of those other non-academic drivers to achievement are actually happening as well. Um, and I think that that has got to be then not just the algorithm of how we look at tech and how we build our platform that's around did you know something going in and did you know it going out, but are we actively looking at changing attitudes and behaviors on this issue as well? Um, so I would say that, uh, that, that yes, that technology can absolutely um, help on the quality and cost dimensions and I think that they're actually related. And one way in which I think that that occurs is that, uh, for example, on this learning dashboard that Adrienne Sanye really got into um, explaining on my behalf, so I feel, I feel lucky because I can kind of start from a different level in the conversation, is that what, what that gives you is um, a kind of discretized uh, understanding of where a student is, and it, it, it can track the student through their own learning progress and pathway in a way that's tailored to that student. So there's a, an inherent efficiency or almost like a leaning out of the educational process. You don't have to spend the same amount of energy talking everybody through stuff that they may already know. And uh, you know, to the example of the economics class where we're all sort of spending the same amount of time and energy when you may already understand the concept and I don't. Um, so there's a, kind of, there's a kind of inherent efficiency associated with uh, what technology or efficiencies that can be gained by what technology can do in terms of the insight and, and the, the ability to kind of modularize um, co concepts into, into discrete pieces of information that can be served up really easily to students. Um, but I don't think that technology really has much domain over the ideas of uh, you know, the socioeconomic factors that we've talked about today. And I think that that's something that's outside of that and that, that technology is going to participate in that and going to have effects um, on that, but it's not necessarily a, a driver. Let, let me offer a, a little more of a kind of sharper critique of the interaction between technology and equality. There's a, um, a scenario or a critique that, that is part of this conversation that goes something like this. Um, first, access to information technology is unequal. Um, we at New America have, through our Open Technology Initiative, are working very hard to try to um, solve that problem, but it remains not fully solved. Um, and particularly as long as there is an um, active um, and in many ways growing participation of private sector organizations, which is where we find a lot of the ferment and entrepreneurialism, um, that energy almost inevitably is focused toward people with resources because there's got to be some sort of revenue model and whether it's anything from baseline broadband um, access to computer technology to probably the more important uh, level of advanced technological literacies that allow people to engage fully with um, information technology, that those are currently unequal in a way that is highly correlated with class and opportunity. Um, and that kind of following up on that, the danger then um, as we move forward in more fully um, integrating uh, technology into education is that uh, it actually has a magnifying effect on, uh, on existing inequality that the people who already have the literacies and the money will learn even more because we're creating even better tools for them um, while the people who um, are already behind will be left either with nothing or with sort of substandard versions of we have now. Um, is that a danger? And if so, how do we solve it? Uh, of course, it's a danger throwout history mm -hmm. in any time, new tools. I mean, the first people to have chariots uh, were not the peasants. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, the first people with... Uh, uh, fully interactive three-dimensional rendering systems for biological sciences um, are not going to be the uh, community college students in Appalachia. Um, but again, that's where I come back to the role of public policy here because the, 
exciting thing about these technologies is that, is that they can deliver, and especially the personalization technologies that Gates, has, uh, Gates Foundation has been supporting. I saw another one that's built on top of Khan Academy that you folks have been developed called the Ed Ready, which is just, I don't know if anybody's taken a look at that, but my goodness, it's startling um, the, uh, uh, what's, what the capacities that it creates right now. But the, the critical role for public policy is to take uh, uh, some small fraction of the money that's wasted on inefficient approaches and redirect it into more efficient approaches um, and to close that gap. Um, the fact that that gap exists when a new tool is created is just the nature of what happens when new tools are created in human civilization. Uh, the wealthy and powerful uh, always get access to new tools before the poor and powerless. But the goal of government and the goal of public policy is to close that gap. And uh, there's a huge opportunity for policy entrepreneurs in this room and, and elsewhere uh, to modernize the policies that govern the uh, 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 operation of our education systems so that um, more people in need get access to the technologies that could change their lives. Can, can I add to that from the perspective of operating on the ground in a lot of these places? I mean, I actually do think that that is one of the, the beauties of where policy has led, right, is the ability to kind of focus on uh, you know, getting the pipe to all of the places that, that it's needed. But I actually think that, you know, I'm much more optimistic than I was even six years ago when we began uh, this company where... And can you just walk us through, because I think sure. people are a little bit less familiar with yeah. EverFi than the other three Absolutely. people. Absolutely. Absolutely. So EverFi is an education technology company. We focus in K-12 and in higher ed. And we focus on all of those critical skills that have tended not to find their way into the core curriculum, either in K-12 and particularly in higher ed, but put huge pressure on students to be able to be successful. So if you think about uh, topics like student loan management, financial wellness, um, health and wellness, uh, civic engagement, all of these topics that when you leave either K-12 or you leave higher ed, um, that the signal to noise ratio of, of demand driven education is demanding that you actually know these types of skills. We use adaptive pathing platforms um, that all along the way are measuring not just knowledge gain, but attitudes and behaviors. And I think that that's one of the differences where I, I disagree a little bit with, with Naomi around the idea that I actually believe that technology will play a role and we're already showing it in terms of being able to not just serve up content that has a right or wrong answer, but to be able to interact with a student in a one-to-one -one environment on topics that are tricky, on topics that they may not actually want to interact in a class setting on, but like sexual assault prevention, like alcohol abuse on campus, all of these regulatory issues that campuses and deans of students are grappling with. Um, and so, you know, we quietly were, were you know, venture backed and we quietly sit behind our partners in thousands and thousands with seven million students, not just having registered. So I think that, it, you know, part of what I hope we get into here is I actually think that we sh disagree earlier that if we set the bar low that we should watch the curve go like this, that it's okay. Um, we fundamentally don't believe in that. We actually think that you should hold us accountable, not just to the number of students that register, but the number of students that actually get fully through our course, uh, which on our platform is about 68%. And so we know that- Way better than Robert Wright. Just not yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and so you know, that's a different topic, but to go back, so I want to have that debate because I think that part of this is on the policy side, huge believer that policy can help, but I also think it's, holding us, the private sector innovators in the economy, to actually helping to get to those communities that have not have gotten the short end of the stick. Um, and so just one example, last week we were in um, a Native American reservation in Utah where they are actively using our financial literacy platform um, in, a, in a college. And, um, I think that what we have seen is that the technology is going to come, the pipe is going to come, but it's our responsibility, I believe, not just to lob over a login and say good luck, to not just make it available, but to actually help figure out how to operationalize in these places that have not necessarily gotten it in, in the past. And so I'm optimistic, but I also think that the bar needs to be high um, to ensure that there's not just a lot of creation of good content, 
but there's actually the systems in place to ensure that that content gets utilized and, and there's efficacy around it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right. no, I, I, just, I wanted yeah. to just clarify one point, if I may. But you know, when I meant what I, when I said that you know the the you know the piece about being able to engage on kind of discrete, simple you know parts of a concept, I actually wasn't referring to the idea that we wouldn't be engaging on very complex ideas. I think the burden is on the uh, educators to take a really complex idea, break it down into its sort of simple simple chunks of of sort of elemental particles, and then figure out how those map together, and then be able to kind of provide that pathway for a student to navigate on their own, rather than um, you know, kind of saying like, uh, you know, here's, a, here's a sort of large curriculum and I expect you to get through it in the way that I intend for you to get through it, but right. that you have the opportunity to navigate that on your own. So, so I guess that's what I meant when I, just, just as yeah. a clarifying point. No, I, I just want to reiterate that. Uh, I think it's a really complicated issue and needless to say we worry about it a lot at the Gates Foundation. And one of the things that we do, because we, are investing both in sort of the creation of these kinds of tools, but we're also trying to evaluate the effectiveness. And what you want to do when evaluating the effectiveness is making sure that they're working for all student populations. And I think a lot of times when products are developed, it's for the middle class. So we spend a lot of time thinking through the partnerships with the right set of institutions that are serving low-income students that are our target population and assessing how effective the, whether it's a, a student support and student retention uh, advising system, whether it's adaptive learning technologies and EverFi sort of coaching and advising, it's you know making sure that these technologies um, are, are presented in a language and in a way that resonates with a particular population that engages them in a way that they want to go deeper into the product rather than just sort of flip to the next page. And that's all as much art as it is science, but I think it's a really critical component of sort of how do you make it better. We tend to often frame our inequality discussion domestically, um, but I know uh, one of the interesting things about a lot of the new uh, education technology providers is that their audience is very much not domestic. Naomi, can you talk a little bit about the international dimension to the students who um, engage with Khan, Khan Academy? Absolutely. Um, so we are in 200 countries at this point in the um, world. So that means there's five countries that we're not in. And I can't remember all of them off the top of my head, but I know North Korea is one of them and there's a few in Africa. So um, I think that, that uh, one of the exciting things about, um, about the access question and, and um, the cost and quality dimension is that the barrier to entry uh, for utilizing Khan Academy or some kind of tool like Khan Academy is, is, is much lower than if you use the, uh, the chariot uh, example that, uh, that you just used, that at that time, the amount of, uh, the, the incremental amount of, uh, of resources that you needed to be able to gain in order to get a chariot, it's much lower now for, um, you know, for, for technology. And while it's true, there's still a barrier. Um, you know, we have examples of, uh, you know, children in orphanages in Mongolia using Khan Academy to study math and actually to create content. Um, and these, that kind of, you know, seeing that kind of access and seeing that kind of like ability for students with very little, um, extraordinarily little, uh, be able to engage at a similar level as a student with a lot of resources is really exciting. And we're definitely seeing that it's, um, it's the, the responsiveness of that international community. I mean, all of our content is, um, is translated by volunteers and it's translated um, you know, entirely in, in Spanish and Portuguese and Turkish in, in whole versions of our site. And it's also uh, you know, 30 languages across our videos. So the desire to go out and do that and translate that content into uh, you know, their native languages is, is obviously there. And I think that it shows that um, uh, you know, a little bit goes a long way in, in. Yeah, Mon Mongolia is interesting. It's one of those countries that uh, I think it has the lowest population density of any country on earth. Um, so they just, they didn't wire anything because that would be right. crazy. They just skipped right to wireless. And, they, and so it's actually, their, their communications infrastructure is pretty good, con yeah. particularly compared to a lot of other infrastructures that they continue to work with. Mm -hmm. um, so Greg, I wanted to talk a little bit, um, you, as you said, the foundation's um, uh, main focus is on uh, the education of traditionally underserved students. Um, and so there's kind of a, there's there are sort of two dynamics that seem to be going on simultaneously with respect to technology. 
um, that may not always complement one another exactly. On the one hand, there's all this concern about the cost of higher education as a barrier um, and uh, rising prices and the inability of uh, financial aid to kind of keep up with that. And um, so inevitably, you get into some discussions around um, labor productivity and trying to you know, use technology to substitute for labor in smart ways. The danger that people then kind of point out is, oh, well, are we headed toward a future where um, only the elite get interpersonal interaction and everyone else is just kind of left with a MOOC, even a good MOOC of some kind, um, which will never sort of fully substitute for that person. Again, based on my remarks this morning, I'm a little more skeptical of that critique. But it's certainly an open question. I think that's it's all remained to be figured out. Is the adaptive learning that you talked about the solution to sort of squaring that circle? So I think that, that um, it's a complicated question I get asked a lot. And I think that, that the philosophy of the foundation is, I, I borrow the tagline from eSurance, technology when you want it, people when you don't. And I think that there are always going to be limits to how much technology can replace a teacher, a faculty member, an instructor. And that's not our long-term goal. I think that technology can bring a lot of efficiency to the education process in the way that Naomi was saying around um, for those students who are more knowledgeable about a particular piece of content, they can sort of move on their own. For those students who are struggling, you can provide more individual support. And I think a struggling student can be rich or poor. It's just, it's really about um, accelerating learning and knowledge acquisition. Um, and I forgot the rest of your question. No, I think that was, so that that was, was, that that was, was good. Question. Okay. Yeah. So um, I, yeah, I think, yeah. I think that, that our hope is to um, make institutions more efficient by allowing them to educate more students through the use of technology and provide more personalized time for those students who need it most. So how do we, and maybe I could, this is maybe a question to you and how you're looking at the institution level, making these investments, how you're talking about public policy. Um, how do we ensure quality then? Um, and, and to be clear, it's a bit of an unfair question because we don't ensure quality now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I thought it was interesting that we heard from uh, the professor from George Mason. Um, who said basically, our service is terrible and doesn't work and no one learns anything. Um, and what's, what's most interesting that, about that is not so much that the fact of it, because I think a lot of people know that's true, it's that, um, and I'll say this because he's joined us right in front, uh, he can go back to his college today and say this on the record and no one cares, right? It's not like it's gonna change, it's not gonna make it be a newspaper article tomorrow, mm -hmm. George Mason professor says. No one learns in our classes, they forget everything. <laughs> um, because, um, so, uh, but nonetheless, yeah. uh, the burden is always higher when we're doing new things, and the burden needs to be higher if we really have, want people to learn. So how do we make sure or, or try to sort of move in that direction? Well, two, two thoughts on that quickly. Um, one of the more hopeful trends is this whole area of open educational resources and the, and the Khan Academy and what it represents, and, the, um, uh, and MOOCs are part of that. But um, the more that... Uh, uh, what people learn in uh, academic institutions is made transparent and people can see what the courses are and what the learning outcomes are and um, uh, what the competencies that can be uh, achieved and verified through the exposure, then we at least get away from some of the, the black box of, you know, I gave you a degree, trust me, there's quality to it. And so I think uh, transparency is always, a, is, is always a great way. I mean, it's how it, most other industries do it. Is, is you have uh, uh, you know you have a JD Power in the automotive industry, which is looking at uh, a tra and creating transparent measures of every factor involved in an automobile, and then people can make better decisions. So transparency is part of it. And the other thing is is just the f the first part of your question about how people learn, and whether or not uh, some people are going to be just doing this technology mediated learning, and what's the qu impact of quality on that versus others who get hands on instruction. One of the things that I'm seeing as we shift from the old model where the, the teacher was the provider of content and, and this, the student was supposed to sit there and listen and absorb it, is now that that is being um, sort of uh, outsourced to these different delivery methods, a school and education is a lot, uh, much more often, is certainly in the hands of the most gifted educators that I get a chance to visit with around the country, turning into uh, more project-based, uh, more about what students can do together they can attack a problem. And in order to attack this problem, whether it's figuring out a new protein folding sequence or 
uh, uh, trying to figure out uh, less expensive ways to desalinate uh, seawater or whatever the real uh, social, economic, business problems that we confront, as schools begin to organize themselves as places where problems get solved, and as those problems get solved, students learn what they need to learn in order to be effective participants in the problem-solving process, then, then people can learn from teachers, but they can learn from each other. Look, I, I, I still remember, I learned how to write in seventh grade from my seventh grade girlfriend. I, I wasn't really very much uh, I interested uh, in writing or school and didn't see the point of it um, uh, until I uh, had a girlfriend who thought it was really important that I not embarrass myself in English class because she was dating me. <laughs> and so she taught me how to write. And, and honestly, I mean, I, uh, I think a lot of us learn from peers. Um, if the peers are well equipped to, uh, to guide us. And what's important for an instructional environment is to, st is to structure those opportunities uh, so, that, so that learning can take place. So I think th th those are my two answers. More transparency uh, promotes quality, and then changing the idea that um, we can only learn from someone who's called a teacher. A teacher can structure a learning opportunity from which um, uh, many, uh, to which many people can contribute, only some of whom might be called teachers. So the only thing I'd add to that is the, um, I think we need better forms of assessment and you, you've got this whole competency-based education movement that's sort of out there floating and I think the assessment piece of that is what's really interesting to me because it's really building on your point about demonstrating the application of the knowledge mm -hmm. and the acquisition of the skills um, as a result, sort of having those competencies and I think that's the other piece. I would add kind of one other piece to, to what you've discussed, which is actually the student voice in this conversation. I think that you know the whole time today we've been listening to kind of where we think higher ed should be, but I think that there's a signal to noise disconnect in terms of the student voice in this equation of where higher ed is going. And I think that you know actually one of you know an, another organization that's been disrupting in higher ed uh, came out with research in or. Uh, a company by the name of Chegg um, last week came out with a really interesting um, research piece that showed that the expectations of the learner of a student in higher ed and the academic and then the employer are totally mismatched, right? So if you look at where students, particularly again first generation students coming in, they, they are seeking demand generated, you know, demand driven higher education. They, their expectation is that we are going to teach them the skills that they need to go out and be successful at their first job, to go get that first job. So if you look at the marketplace, the market is saying, I want, my expectation is when I come to your campus, you're going to teach me what I need for my first job. When they went out and surveyed all the academics, they believed that their job was to educate them for the long-term skills that they need over the course of a career, critical thinking skills, you know, all of those. And then they surveyed the employers. And the employers said, we need both. But what we don't have right now is we've got 4 million open jobs and 2.5 you know, million people to fill them. And so there's a disconnect in terms of what demand-driven higher education is going to be. And I think that, that part of that is filling that void, not just what, with what professors think that they can stand in front of a camera and suddenly continue to teach, but also looking at what is being demanded by the actual consumer of higher ed, which is students. And I think that that voice in this debate is really, really important. And I think that that alone will change, I think, how higher education um, looks uh, with technology. I guess the only thing that I would add would be along the kind of adaptive learning element of it, which is that I think that because of the scale um, that you know the adaptive learning platforms are able to operate at, I mean, we, we just passed the two billion math problems practiced on Khan Academy, Mark, about a week ago. And um, because of that, we're able to, and, and not just us, but other uh, environments as well, to evaluate the efficacy of the learning pathways that we're creating very quickly and run you know, um, you know, very involved tests on, you know, based on, on, on the types of students, the environments, and other things. So I think somebody said it earlier, it's just sort of the, the machine learning is, is only going to advance. So the more that we, the more that we get, the more we're able to give. 
Um, and that's an element. I think when you combine that with that transparency and the personalization, the student is then walking around with a kind of a viable pro platform that they can kind of trust is, is a tested, it's a truly, like it's a, it's a tire that's been kicked a lot and, um, and they can show their progress within it and that follows them no matter where they are. Um, and that's something that has to kind of, you know, um, uh, speak to the general community, it, it, you know. Um, we're catching up on our schedule a little bit, so I think we'll go to questions now from the audience. Um, same, same rules as before, please wait for the mic and identify yourself. Hi, this is on, okay. I'm Lindsay Saren, I'm from the University of Maryland, and I'm gonna admit bias that I'm a librarian, and so my ilk is towards digital literacy and instruction. And I've heard a lot today, we've kind of gotten to, to where we're talking about access and ability to use technology, but we just got to it and it's only been brought up briefly. I would love to hear more about how we deal with the fact that there are a lot of students, even in the United States, even in you know, wealthy areas, who don't have digital literacy skills and can't use the kinds of technologies that you guys are talking about. And especially in the context of public policy, I mean, we have the FCC right now who's essentially deregulating net neutrality and that's gonna make broadband more expensive, it's gonna make technology access more expensive. What do we do about that and how does that play into what the work that you guys are all doing? Um, so, uh, I switched my careers from writing about uh, technology to trying to uh, impact uh, public policy around technology in, in part because I think we have a crisis. Um, there are, uh, you could, 80%, uh, everybody remembers net day. Remember net day and everybody made a big deal about wiring the schools? Um, and what people don't know who were not in the schools that almost all of those efforts stopped at the school front office. And that 80% of our K-12 schools have no broadband access in the classroom. I mean, uh, dozens of countries are ahead of us. Uh, our underinvestment um, and, and lack of focus on um, developing, applying, and insisting on the appropriate pu public policies to close these gaps is appalling. And it's, and it's one of the reasons that, that I, I switched professions. And, uh, and I would encourage people to take a look at what are the public policies that govern how technology is used in your local school district. Uh, there is opportunities to create new policy approaches at every level of our participatory democracy, whether it's the school district level, the state level, the regional level, uh, and certainly at the federal level. And, um, uh, and we're very far behind in harmonizing uh, public policies with the opportunities that these technologies create. So I, I don't think the right approach is to um, denigrate the opportunities, but the right approach is to insist, um, uh, as we've been trying to do in the Department of Education and as Secretary Duncan has been trying to do by leading the effort to reconfigure how federal funds are used to support broadband in the schools, that we get those classrooms wired, um, that we get them wired as quickly as we can and that we put available tools and technologies in the hands of every student who could benefit from them. That's it, it, the short, the problem in this country is not resources. At the higher ed side, we have $150 billion. Some tiny fraction of that could close many of these gaps. The problem is paralysis on the public policy side. And, and uh, so I would, uh, I, I commend your question and I think it deserves uh, even more outrage than you expressed. It's also going to come to a head this year because all of state is at the K-12 level, right? Because so many state assessments now, you're having to take online. It's not going to be Khan and Everfi that are forcing this conversation. It's going to be state assessments at the K-12 level because you as parents are going to see that your students now have to take all of their state assessments and common core assessments online. And when your principal is suddenly trying to figure out how they rotate that, that laptop cart to 12 different classrooms, that is where I think the outrage is going to come. And my sense is that's actually going to help all of us in this industry to figure it out much quicker than many have hoped. Yes. Yeah, uh, Brian Kaplan, George Mason University. Uh, so I'm wondering, are there any countries on Earth where new high-tech alternatives to traditional education are actually winning? Where they actu where actually traditional brick and the brick, traditional, uh, traditional brick and mortar colleges have lower status and where the elites don't go there and instead they do something like Khan Academy like any, anywhere. I actually know of uh, um, the um, he's from Peru and I'm blanking on his name right now but he has uh, developed a um, school outside of the um, 
outside of the, the classic um, uh, you know, brick and mortar, it is, he uses Khan Academy and uh, several other kind of these more competency-based. It's a for-profit school. Um, I think he charges something like $100 a year. And, um, and, and the status of that school is actually considered to be pretty high. It's not a, it's not a country that's doing very well in terms of their education overall. So, I'm not, you know, so I think that he's um, kind of a big fish in a little pond in some ways. Um, but, I, but because maybe that, that there isn't a lot of pre-existing infrastructure that he has to battle, he's kind of got a faster, it's kind of like the cell phone in Asia or something. Um, you know, it's like a faster adoption than you might experience here where we're very accustomed to the idea of, uh, you know, um, that college means stage on a stage. And that's, you know, a, a mindset shift that we are grappling with. I think, I mean, just a sort of like large observation in response to that is that, um, you know, as we all know, the last 30 years has been, have seen a tremendous change in the reduction of the percent of all people on earth who are impoverished, right? So we have an absolute reduction in the number of people in poverty, even as the size of the, you know, we, the overall population grew. The next phase of that um, <coughs> is, according to the OACD, like their mid-range projection, the number of people in the global middle class is going to grow by 3 billion from today until 15 or 20 years from now. There's no way that we're going to build colleges as we know them to educate those 3 billion people <coughs> because education is what you want when you get in the middle class. It's the first thing you want. It means you've got a roof over your head, food in your stomach, maybe some access to health care. Education is next. Um, so I think it's a fair point, and I think the sort of larger point that anyone who's making this argument has to contend with the fact that we've had technology after technology after technology with lots of promises. Um, you really do have to make a strong, as Jeff Salingo said, this time is different argument, but I do think that the sheer scale of the market is something that is going to grow without really any precedent at all. Um, and that, that I think, I think that technology will just inevitably play a much larger role in, in serving those people. Sure, and I'll, I'll give you one cool example. I mean, that, that I, I get to travel around and see stuff, but um, on the K-12 side, take a look at the, I guess they just recently changed their name, but the Open High School of Utah. Fascinating idea. Um, where they created a high school where all of the curriculum is available online 24-7. Um, the students don't come to class in the regular conventional sense. I think they come and they meet in classes and work groups that are project-based once a week or so. One of the cool things about that is that uh, because all of the curriculum for high school is available online 24-7, it means the 8th graders can see what the ninth graders are working on, then the 10th graders can go back and look at what the 7th graders are working on. Uh, they have some good data that shows they're um, getting higher graduation rates. More of those kids are going to college. Um, they're expanding and scaling that approach. So um, I don't know if it's uh, uh, you know, a question of uh, one is beating the other, but, but as these models are developing, we're certainly seeing some very encouraging um, uh, progress and stories of, uh, and, and evidence um, of uh, success uh, in, in improving both the quality of teaching and learning. I think that's undisputable. Other questions? Yes. Hi, I'm Judy Ayala, and I'm president of Small Startup uh, here in DC. And um, I'm curious to know, um, mostly for um, Khan Academy and, and EverFi, if the um, what the the there, if there's new research that shows how people learn with the introduction of technology. And um, how is it being used um, in these new platforms um, that are emerging? Thank you. I would say one of the exciting things about um, this kind of gets to the idea. I think um, Adrian brought it up of sort of moving, moving us up the food chain. That when we start, um, you know, being able to kind of deliver content at a certain, you know, sort of feeling like we kind of gotten the. Um, I'm not going to say that we've nailed like delivering the content part of it, but you know, sort of like when it when it stops being just about you know, do you get one plus one? Um, what are the other things that might might be a barrier to you learning the next concept? And you know, so we're doing a lot of exploration with growth mindsets, and I think there's a, a trend in in pushing towards the so-called soft skills and understanding those better. And I think that you know the College of the future is going to understand those a lot better and is going to be much more actively engaging in things that we think of as being sort of uh, fluffy today, um, but as realizing that those are actually core skills. And we're, we're doing a lot of um, 
uh, you know, A-B testing with growth mindset messaging and, um, you know, elements into our platform to see how it affects uh, the learning curve? We're doing the same, I think, in terms of looking at, um, you know, I started by saying that part of this conversation has been just about, like, knowledge gain, right? Which is just how do you communicate, you know, knowledge around these topics. I think that because of the topics that we work on, attitude and behavior change is a huge piece of that. So we've been using a lot of population health um, models around how you think about these types of issues. And I've done some research with uh, the National Institutes of Health that have looked at our platform around how do you actively path students. So when they tell you, for example, that they are a drinker or a non-drinker, how do you path them in a way that allows them to learn information in a way that they'll be receptive to? And that's, I think, the beauty of adaptive pathing technology is our ability to kind of take information in um, that are on the softer skills and then feed them back a path that actually is more receptive to their attitudes and behaviors. Um, and I think there's a long way to go. I think that, you know, you brought up this idea of assessment and efficacy. I think anybody new in this field realizes that the ed tech industry is going to have to lead on that. But I also believe that it's got to be in parallel with, with, um, with thinking about how you actually engage with a user. So, you know, for a long time we've been talking about the achievement gap or the dropout gap in K-12 or higher ed. We at EverFi firmly believe that you actually cannot start closing that achievement gap if your user experience is still one voice with a chalkboard to a group of students. And so there are lots of great organizations, including Khan, but a company that went public last week that I think to you is a company that's been working with a lot of higher ed institutions um, to take full programs from Georgetown, from University of South Carolina, um, Southern California and put them online with a lot of that interactivity. And I think that there's a lot of models out there that we really should be looking at around the efficacy of this. I think we have time for one more question, if there is one. Um, if not, please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you.